as we continue in chapter 20, we're going to see, well, some of the greatest events in the history of the world. Oh, now they're future history, but they will be the greatest events. We're going to see the binding and the final judgment of Satan. Everybody say, yay. yay. We're going to see the millennial reign of Christ. Everybody say, yay. yay. We're also going to see the great white throne judgment. Everybody say, whoa. We need to pay very close attention to that which we are going to be given because it answers so many questions within the heart of man. And so, without further ado, and without a long introduction this morning, let's jump in to verse 1 of chapter 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. So here we see Satan finally arrested and imprisoned. And it's interesting because it's not by the Lord Himself. It's not by a SWAT team made up of elite archangels. It's a single unnamed angel that is able to take and to bind the enemy. The enemy at this point in time has lost all of his power and is easily defeated and easily constrained. But folks, we need to understand that when it comes to the power of God and the enemy's ability to overcome it, it has never been so. The enemy has never had any power over God. As a created being, he's not the cosmic counterpart to God or Jesus. And while the battle for man's souls has raged, and while there is a great struggle in the real person of an enemy, Satan is created. And therefore subject to and under the authority of the God who created him. So often when someone commits a terrible or a heinous crime, we view them as some sort of monster. Hollywood has helped us with this view with supervillains and monsters of all type, and in our mind it seems to make perfect sense because only a monster could commit such horrific types of crimes. And so when we think about what is evil, we think about this, this monstrosity in relationship to that which is coming against us. In the recent school shootings in Florida, and we know that there have been attributed all kinds of causes, and we're not going to get into any of that. But the one thing that most, if not everyone, can agree on is that an act of taking life in this manner represents pure evil. That is perpetrated by a monster. Because no one can fathom that anyone could do this type of harm, do this type of carnage, take lives in such a fashion, if they weren't a monster yet when the TV shows the picture of the 19-year-old kid that perpetrated it, what we see is confusion and pimples. We don't necessarily see a satanically controlled monster at the end of the process. And such is going to be the case when Satan is revealed at this time, when we look upon him at this particular point in time. Isaiah 14, 16 says that when we look upon Satan, we will say, is this the one? that troubled the whole world. As if to say, it was this guy? I mean, all of the trouble, all of the, 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 the problems that were caused, all of the evil, all of the, the influence that Satan exercised upon the earth for all of the time in, in, in mankind's history, you mean, this was the guy? And yet, we know that Satan's influence is real and true. But we have a defense and our best defense against Satan is to understand who he is and how he operates. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people that have a very, very wrong view of Satan. Many see Satan as just a non-person or a symbol of what is bad in the world. If we have to blame somebody, let's blame Satan. Why not? A nine-year-old Barna poll revealed that among self, listen, self-proclaimed Christians, that as many as four in ten Christians, by their own admission, see Satan as nothing more than a symbol for evil. Just a symbol. Now in addition, two out of ten 
agreed with this position very strongly. Which means that as recent ago as nine years ago, that six out of ten self-proclaimed Christians didn't recognize that Satan was a real entity, didn't recognize that he was a real persona and an influence that was working to destroy mankind and his relationship with God. Yet we know that Jesus had no problem whatsoever identifying Satan as a real enemy. In John 12, 31, Jesus called Satan the God of this world and identified Satan as the enemy not only of God, but of mankind, seeking only to destroy and devour. But understand that while Satan has the ability to influence, he does not have the power to make us sin. Oh, let me say that again. While Satan has the ability to influence us, he doesn't have and cannot exercise power that would cause or force us to sin. Now, how many of you in the room remember a comedian years ago by the name of Flip Wilson? For those of you that don't remember, check with an old person. They'll fill you in. (laughs) Flip Wilson coined a phrase. You remember what it was? The devil made me do it. Well, Flip was wrong. Because again, while Satan has the ability to influence us, the act and the follow-through is all us. The carrying out of the sin, the following through, the willful disobedience, all comes from within our heart, not from outside stimulus. How many of you, as as your children were growing up, and you would say, well, why did you do that? And they said, well, because Johnny did it. And what would you say? Well, if Johnny jumped off a bridge. You see, we weren't buying into the idea that Johnny was the one that was making up your mind any more than we were with our kids. Then we can see that the devil is the one that's making up our mind any more with us. Because it's our mind, not his. We all have evil that affects our lives. It may be something within our marriage, our family, or our job. Maybe it's a deeply hidden sin within our heart. There may be persistent painful problems over which we think we don't have any control, over over which we think we can't do anything about it. The enemy is just too strong. I can't overcome it. The devil made me do it. Guys, it's not so. It's not so. While real... While influential, while powerful, not to be trifled with, the enemy has no means by which he can exercise authority over God, over his son, Jesus, or over us as we abide within. In Matthew 6, 16, Simon Peter answered and said this, answering the question of Jesus when Jesus asked him, who do men say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You see, the solution for us to overcome the enemy, the solution for us to overcome a perceived power that Satan would have in our life is to understand and to recognize who we are in Jesus Christ. And it starts first by recognizing who Jesus is. You see, the revelation wasn't that, oh, gee, Peter came up with a great idea and Jesus was going to make Peter the rock. No, no, no. The rock in which is being identified here that the church will stand upon is the truth and the revelation of God that Jesus Christ is the Savior, the Messiah. The rock is Jesus Christ. And I love what he says here. He says, And the gates of hell shall not prevail against what? What was, what was the rock going to build upon? Or what was going to build upon the rock? It was going to be what? The church. How many churches do we have in here? Anybody in here a church? Put your hand up. That would be all of you, by the way. Your church. So the gates of hell will not prevail against you, if we recognize that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. This changed everything for Peter. 
This, this understanding, this revelation that came from the Heavenly Father put something into Peter's life that had not been there before. And guys, it's the same for us when we realize just who Jesus is in our lives. There's a lot of folks that have religion. There's a lot of folks who are good people by standards that the world would apply. There's a lot of folks who do good things. It's right to read your Bible and to even be a part of the church. But when we come to the knowledge that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, when we understand and we recognize that we belong to Him, then we come into a completely new and different relationship. Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against you. Against you. Against me. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a tendency to take Jesus at His word. And so if He says that the gates of hell will not prevail against me, the first thing I have to do is I have to understand that the gates of hell are a fixed object, not something that's chasing me. I don't have this set of gates running around chasing me, trying to smack me everywhere I go. The gates of hell are a fixed object, and they're fixed between me and the areas that God wants me to claim victory in, and Satan is the one that's holding them closed. And as long as I give him the authority, as long as I give him opportunity to keep me out of those areas because I don't exercise faith in Jesus who has told me that they will not prevail, they will. And Satan will be able to hold me out of areas in my life in which I want to claim victory. So what's troubling you? Where are your strongholds? Is it addiction? Depression? Lustful thoughts? Maybe pornography? Is it your temper? Anybody in here got a temper? Look at all these guys with tempers won't put their hand up. <laughs> yeah, he's got his hand up. Yeah, Beth's like... How about your attitude towards others? Is it worry or anxiety that drives you to sin? Folk, understand, the Lord has already won the battle. The victory is already ours. We need only to trust and to push open the gates of hell in order to claim the victory. How do we do this? Well, prayer, confession of our sin, through staying close and walking with the Lord daily, knowing that we're not alone, believing in the promises of God, and knowing, listen, that Satan only has the power to overcome if we allow him. Now see, that's a hard thought for a lot of folks. A lot of folks don't realize the power that we possess within our own lives based on a relationship with Jesus Christ, based on the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. But what we are promised is we are told that the gates of hell will not prevail. So if Satan is coming around and knocking on your door and trying to get you to do things that you don't want to do, Satan's coming around trying to tell you that you are the type of person that you don't want to be, if Satan's coming around and trying to lead you down a path that you don't want to go, you don't have to go. You can stay right where you're at in Jesus Christ. And you can tell Satan, you need to leave. And when you do, leave the door open. Open the gates. And we open the gates when we do the right things in relationship to how we treat others. We do the right things when we trust God, even when others don't. We take ter territory when we choose not to complain. It's one of the reasons that I love that song, Sustained, so much. I don't know why I've ever complained. Uh, any, any complainers in here? Good. We choose not to fight with our spouse or to argue with our kids or our boss. We push open the gates of hell when we avoid backbiting or criticizing or judging others. The gates open wide when we start praying, when we start giving, when we start blessing, when we start fellowshipping, and when we start trusting that the Lord is greater than our enemy. The gates of hell cannot stand up to the faith, pure faith, that we would exercise in Jesus Christ. In verse 2 it says, And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a while. Now when I first read this, i got to tell you, it didn't make much sense to me that Jesus 
would finally return to the earth, make everything right, that he's locked up Satan, the world is now free from evil, why in the world would he then, after a thousand years, kick him out and release him for a while? It didn't make any sense. It's like, you got to be kidding me. You finally have eradicated evil, and now you're going to wait a little while and then turn him loose again. And there's a simple answer, and the answer simply boils down to one word, and that word is love. But we're going to have to explore a little bit in order to understand it. So stay with me for a bit. You see, during this thousand year period, the world is going to be phenomenal for those that love the Lord. All the saints of God, all the 144,000 Jewish evangelists, all that died in the Lord, all that were raptured or were martyred during the tribulation period are going to be on the earth with Jesus, going to return with Jesus Christ. Now, For those of us that returned with Him, we're going to be sporting new bodies. Anybody in here besides me ready for a new body? Man, am I ready for a new body. These bodies are going to be so cool because these bodies aren't going to know pain. These bodies aren't going to know fatigue. These bodies aren't going to be limited by space. We should be able to, in in my estimation, just be able to think it and be there. I mean, I don't know exactly how it's going to work, but this is going to be so amazing in relationship to the fact that these bodies aren't going to be subject to calories. You'll be able to eat whatever you want. Yeah. No medications, no doctors, no disease, no nothing. And it says that we're going to be set in a position and in a place to rule over the world. (sighs) Ah. And see, this is where a lot of people get confused because a lot of people think, well, what's going to be left? Who are we going to rule over? I mean, if we've all come back with Jesus and if it's all about the saints and it's all, who's left? Well, Scripture reveals to us that out of those that go through the tribulation that there's a very large portion, maybe one in ten of the population of the earth that will still be here, will survive the great tribulation period. They'll be the ones that did not take the mark of the beast, but they're not necessarily in Christ. There's going to be those that have gone through this time period, maybe because they were survivalists or because they chose to to avoid, but but they're going to be here. And if we look at the statistics right now, there's about 6 billion people on the face of the planet, maybe a little bit more. So if 1 in 10 survive, that means that there could be 600 million that come through. And out of the 600 million that don't take the mark of the beast, well... Who knows? Could be 10% of those. Could be 6 million. Could be 20. Who knows? It's not about the number. It's about understanding and realizing that there will be people on the earth that are still in a place of not accepting Jesus Christ fully, but also not accepting the mark of the beast. So when we return, we're going to rule and reign because what's going to take place is Jesus Christ is going to establish in this thousand year period a time of peace. There'll be no evil. There'll be no wars. There'll There'll be an a, a abundancy on the earth as was like it was supposed to be in the, in the early times. That's, that the earth is going to produce. These survivors who refuse to take the mark are, are going to be allowed to enter into this millennial reign of Christ. And during this thousand year period, everything's going to be perfect. There's not going to be, as we said, any disease. There's not going to be any crime. There's not going to be any corrupt politicians, everybody's going to follow the righteousness of Christ. But the problem is, is during this time, during this thousand year period, that there is going to be people born upon the earth. Now, I don't know how this impacts us. There's a lot of questions in the Bible that I don't have answers to, and this is one of them, but I know that those that are here, and if people do nothing else, that they have a tendency to multiply. And if you've got several million people, and you've got a thousand years, you're going to come up with a lot of people. So there's going to be a population regrowth upon the earth after this time frame. And what's going to take place is that the people born during this time are going to grow up in a perfect world where righteousness is forced and they're not going to have a choice but to follow God. You see, there's going to be only one rule, one law of the land, and that's going to be Jesus Christ. And Scripture tells us that He's going to rule with an iron rod. There'll be no exception. Now, for those that agree with him, bring it on. 
problem is, is that not all will. And this is why after a thousand years, Satan's going to be released. You see, in order for love to be love, and we've talked about this I don't know how many times in the past, in order for love to be love, it has to be given freely. You can't force somebody to love you. You can't make somebody love you. You can't compel them to love you. In order for somebody to love you, they have to do so of their own free will and their own choice. And these that will be born during this thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ and the millennial reign will not have been given a choice. So if God is to be fair, and He always is, the choice has to be given for them to choose rather or not to follow Jesus Christ. Rather or not to follow God the Father. And it says, I saw in verse 4, thrones that they set on them. The judgment was committed to them. That would be us. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus for the word of, of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the marks on their foreheads and their hands. And they lived and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who is part of the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. All right, let's break this down. Here what we see is we see that those that will come back with the Lord, those that have accepted Jesus Christ, those that were martyred during the Great Tribulation will be those that rule and reign with Jesus for a thousand years. Those who have died in Christ will be resurrected one time, but those who died without Christ will also be resurrected. But the difference is, is that those that are resurrected in Christ will be resurrected immediately. Those who did not die in Christ will be held for the thousand years. They won't be resurrected, but here's the key. Everyone will be resurrected. It's a matter of when. And so it's so important that we understand that for those that are in this place of not choosing, that they are going to live again. The problem is, it says, blessed is he who is part of the first resurrection. Why? Well, because while we'll live again, will not die again. You see, those that are part of the first resurrection will go on to eternal life. Those who are part of the second resurrection will be resurrected to die once again. And we'll see that more in just a moment. Now, we don't have to worry about the influence of the enemy during the time of his release. Because for those that are in Jesus Christ, we're going to find that there's no authority, that there's no power, that there's no appeal to sin. We're not going to move back into sin. We're going to be in glorified bodies worshiping the Lord. But we're going to be seeing all of this as it unfolds. And what's going to take place and what's going to happen is that those that are, well, able, willing, and decide to oppose Jesus Christ will rebel against the Lord. It's interesting to think that if you're born twice, you only die once. You remember when Jesus told Nick at night? He went to Nicodemus at night and he, and he, and he, said, he said, if you're born of, the, of, of water and you're born in, in the flesh, you also then have to be born of the Spirit in order to see the kingdom of God. And of course, I'm paraphrasing here. And he said that by being born twice, then you're only going to die once. But if you're only born once, you're going to die twice. Now, it says, When the thousand years had expired, Satan will be released from his prison. And he will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. And Gog and Magog will gather to them together to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. It's almost beyond comprehension that after a thousand years of living in complete peace, in abundance, that anyone would choose to follow the enemy. But we see here that there's going to be such a multitude that it can't be numbered. And, and they're going to be strong enough to form an army to come against the city of Jerusalem. And it's amazing to me because that this, this idea that somehow or another that environment produces a, a specific type of, of, 
of product. And, you know, the psychologists and the social workers all tell us that we are all a product of our environment. Well, the environment that's been going on is for a thousand years, there's been the righteousness of Jesus Christ. There's been no wars. There's been no disease. There's been total peace. There's not been any, any problems in the world. There's been no crime. And now we got people going, we want that back. I really miss corrupt politicians, don't you? Why can't we have a little crime? Why can't we break the law? Why can't? And there's going to be those that are going to take and to set themselves aside in such numbers that they're going to be able to formulate an army that's going to encircle all of Jerusalem to fight back against God. Can you? I mean, we're fighting for a righteous kingdom. There's going to be those that are born in this time of perfect peace that are going to fight against it. And they're going to come together under banner with the enemy. And it says... Fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they were tormented day and night forever and ever. Underline forever and ever. There's not going to be a repeat or a do-over for mankind. For those of you that may be shocked by this, I just want to reveal to you there is no such thing as reincarnation. You don't come back as another thing or another being or another, another type of, of animal or something like that. You have not been another person in another life. It doesn't happen. God doesn't allow it. But there's also not going to be a second chance other than the fact that those that are involved and are on the earth at this point in time are going to get an opportunity to choose. The Lord's going to say, choose, done not going to be another experiment in mankind's willingness to love a loving God. It's going to be a matter of a simple choice. And once the choice is made, then judgment is going to fall. But here's the cool thing. When this happens, we don't have to worry about it. Our future is secured forever and ever. Now the Scary part is so are those who reject. And this is one of the strongest places in the Greek language that identifies eternity in relationship to the sentence for Satan and those who follow him when it says forever and ever. Now see, there are those, and you'll, you'll see it as we read on, that, that want to somehow put an end period or an end date or an expiration on hell. Oh, well, after the Lord comes back and, and things are established, well, then basically these people will just be destroyed and they won't exist anymore. Wrong. As heaven is eternal, as God is eternal, and we will live forever and ever, those who are in Christ with Him, so will those who refuse His salvation. They will live forever and ever separated from God in a place called hell with Satan and with his angels in such a place that it tells us that it's a place of the gnashing of teeth, of weeping and of wailing and of constant torment, and it will never end. And I believe that as part of this whole process is that we will re we'll see them remember every single day that they didn't choose wisely. Have you ever had that time in your life where you made a mistake? just one and you relive the consequences of that mistake over and over and over in your mind making it even more worse every time that you do it you know man i can't believe i did that and then two days later you're still like man i still can't believe i did that and then a month later man i still can't believe and, and if you would just stop thinking about it it would have gotten better but you can't let it get better because you continue to i think that that's going to be part of hell's experience is that these people are going to relive over and over and over again every day of their existence for all of eternity the moment that they could have chosen they didn't that's hell in light of eternity with jesus christ in God's heaven, a place where, as opposed to the weeping and the gnashing of teeth, there are no tears, there is no pain, there is no sorrow, only joy. So then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it. 
from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And, they, and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And the books were opened. John now sees those who've rejected Jesus Christ standing in front of a line for judgment. We as believers won't stand in this judgment. Say amen. This great white throne judgment is not applied to believers. Why? We have already been judged. You see, there was another throne called Calvary. There was another crown that was worn that wasn't gold, that was made of thorns, that as Jesus Christ hung on Calvary, He paid the debt for our sin which was judged on that same day. See, our sin's judged, past, present, and future. Not only have we been judged, and guess what? You're guilty. But Jesus paid for it. The precious blood of Jesus Christ has paid a debt that we could have never paid. And so on this day, the judgment is for those who have refused. We'll not see this. I don't know if we'll be present. I think when I read that, heaven's going to be a place of joy and of no tears and of no sadness. I, I almost feel like we're not even going to be exposed to this. Because we're going to see, if we were, people we know. Oh, and there's Larry. Oh, there's... There's Judy. I, I, I thought Judy was... So see, I can't, I, I can't fathom us having to, to, to see that kind, of, that kind of heartbreak. But guys, the reality is that when the books are opened, the judgment will begin. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things that are written in the books. And the sea gave up their dead who were in it. And death and Hades delivered up its dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one, according to his works. Again, life is full of choices and it's very easy to make mistakes. But there's one mistake that we cannot afford to make. We cannot afford to reject Jesus Christ. There's nothing more important in life. There's not a decision that can be made that is more significant. There's not any type of, of, of decision that you will make that could lead to the consequences of this decision. Period. Who you marry, important? Absolutely. Pick a winner. My wife did. Where you work? Eh, it's kind of important. Kind of car you drive? <laughs> Who cares? But when it comes to eternity, this is a mistake that we can't afford to make. This is a choice that we, we can't avoid and we cannot choose poorly and have good results. And yet the choice is so simple. The greatest misnomer mistake that people will make in relationship to this is buying into the belief that somehow or another you live once and then you die. Wrong. Wrong. If you're born twice, you die once. If you're born once, you die twice. But guess what? If you're born, you're going to live in eternity. One place or another. There's not going to be an end. It's not going to be just over. Oh, grab all you can get while you go. You only go around once. <laughs> Forever. Those that believe that are going to be in for a rude resurrection. Not only will they wait in hell for a thousand years while we as believers rule on the earth, but once... That's finished. They're going to find themselves standing before the judgment seat of a righteous God. So how do they get there? I mean, what, what's, what's the thing? I mean, what, what does it take to stand before the great, great white throne judgment seat? I mean, there's only basically one thing that will exclude someone from getting in heaven. 
there's a lot of reasons that people think it's hard. I mean, there's, unfortunately, religion has messed this up terribly. Religion has made the path to heaven very difficult. You guys know that, right? Sign here, step here, bend here, stoop here, turn around, read this, do that. You know, all those steps and procedures that somehow or another make it hard to get to heaven. And we've been told, oh, it's so hard to be a Christian. It's so hard to live for the Creator, God of the universe. It's difficult. Oh, this life is so... Really? I don't know. The reality is, is that it's very, very simple to receive salvation. And as easy as it is to receive salvation, the way that you wind up in front of this judgment for all of eternity separated from God is equally as, as, as simple. Fail to choose Jesus. That's all it takes. That's all you got to do is just one act of omission, just one act of not choosing Jesus Christ will guarantee you an audience in front of the judge at this throne judgment. It's also interesting that throughout the years, people have tried to give weight to different sin. Try to make certain sins more significant than others. Well, listen to what Matthew 12 31 says. It says, Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men. Wow, there you go. Everyone can be forgiven. But the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come. Now this is an area where a lot of people struggle because they don't understand what is this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Some people have reduced it all the way down to, well, blasphemy is just using God's name in vain. If you say GD... You're in peril of, of, of eternal fire and damnation. Stop it. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is to reject the testimony and the witness of the Holy Spirit that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. That Jesus Christ is the Savior. There's only one sin that will keep you out of heaven, and it's denying the testimony of the Holy Spirit. By not agreeing. See, this Holy Spirit was sent into the world to convict man of his sin and to point us towards Jesus Christ. That's the whole purpose and role. The Holy Spirit comes in and walks beside you and says, Hey, you need to accept Jesus Christ. Hey, you need to accept Jesus Christ. And as we walk through life, there'll be opportunities that the Spirit will come and He'll say, Hey, you need to accept Jesus Christ. And we keep saying, Well, maybe. Until so we finally say no. And when we make up our mind and we say no, there'll come a time when the Holy Spirit will say, all right, you're on your own. Scary. I'm glad He didn't give up on me because He had to come by my house a lot to get my attention. The only sin. You see, there is no weight. <laughs> Regardless of what some religions would tell you, it doesn't matter if you tell a white lie or if you are totally deceptive. It's not the difference between two prayers and ten prayers. There's no meter in heaven. God doesn't look at sin. He says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin are death, and all are destined to death because we are all sinners. But all sin can be forgiven. All sin can be forgiven. Except one. Except one. Don't accept Jesus Christ, and you won't get into heaven. It's, it's that simple. It's not difficult. Now, on the other hand, if you want to get into heaven, it's simple. Accept Jesus Christ, and you're in. You see, that's what it all boils down to. And those are the things that people make it so complicated in, in our pursuit of God, in our pursuit of understanding. People want to make it so hard to get to heaven. You want to go to heaven? Believe in Jesus Christ. Make Him the Lord of your life. Believe that He's the Son of God. Believe that He came, that He died, and He rose again, that He sits at the right hand of the Father, even now pleading your case so that you're not guilty because the guilt was placed on Him. You do that, and you're in. Anybody besides me want to go to heaven? Let's go. Now, if you haven't made that decision, why? Why? What are you waiting for? 
What could you possibly think that somehow or another through your own behavior, through your own efforts, through your own goodness, that somehow or another that that's going to merit, that that's going to somehow please and turn God into, into something that He's not, which would be just. I don't know what this is going to look like, but I've kind of played it out in my head and I see a man standing and his name's called and he stands up in front of it and here's God on the throne. And as they open the books, they start reading. All of a sudden, his expression changes. And all of a sudden, he starts sweating. His knees start knocking together as he realizes that they wrote down everything. They got it all. Nothing was concealed. Everything now revealed. And in his best lawyer voice, he cries out to God, God, Your Honor, let me explain. And because God is gracious, (laughs) he says, go ahead. (laughs) I've got time. Well, Your Honor, you see, I, I don't really understand why I'm here. I mean, I always believed in you. I always tried to live the best that I could. I tried to do more good than I did bad. I prayed from time to time, especially especially when I was in trouble. I even went to church on Christmas and Easter. I have to say that that whole church thing really wasn't my bag. You see, there's so many different religions and so many churches, I didn't know which one was right. Everybody claimed to have the real thing, but after I hung out at a few of them, it just became confusing. And so I thought, eh, I, just, I don't need church. God would look at him and say, I didn't tell you to do good. I didn't tell you to go to church. I told you to believe in my son, Jesus Christ, and receive him. Oh, but, 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 but your honor, you see, it, I almost believed in Jesus once. I did, but there was this guy at work. We called him Timmy the Christian. Timmy was always telling people about Jesus. Timmy was always telling us how bad we were. He was always telling us how we needed to accept Jesus Christ. And then Timmy did something one day that got me fired. And he didn't fess up. What an example. He was one of your guys. He was one of the guys that I'm supposed to look to and go, oh, holier than thou. He's the Christian. I want to be like him. And the Lord would just interrupt and say, excuse me. I didn't tell you to follow anyone other than my son, Jesus Christ. Example after example. One by one, all of the excuses are dismantled until... He stands before God with no defense at all. As the reading of the book is completed, there'll be no question as to the verdict that you're guilty of rejecting Jesus Christ. And as some such are condemned to die again. But this time, the death will last for all of eternity. You see, in order to receive this verdict in opposition to what many think, you have to work really hard. I mean, you really do. You have to work hard. You see, you had to have rejected Jesus Christ who died and gave Himself for you and reject the witness of the Holy Spirit who continually prompted you to do so. You had to say that the blood of Jesus Christ isn't necessary. I refuse and reject the idea that I'm a sinner and that I need salvation and so therefore Christ has nothing for me. I don't have any debts that need to be paid. And refusing Jesus will guarantee you a place in the great white throne judgment and a condemnation to all of eternity in the lake of fire. In verse 14 it says, Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Guys, there's only one mistake that you can't afford to make. The mistake that cannot be afforded is the mistake of rejecting Jesus Christ. It's not about religion. It's not about saying a prayer. It's not about anything other than the faith that you would exercise that you would place in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And if you're here today, I don't want to encourage you. I want to beg you. This is your future. 
If you're here today and you haven't received Jesus Christ, if you've never had a serious conversation in your heart with the Holy Spirit as to why it is that you need to repent of your sin and receive salvation and have your sins judged now and paid for, then today's the day to do that. There's no other opportunity that may be afforded. You may not be here tomorrow. You may not be here for the end of this service. We don't know. Our breath isn't guaranteed. But if that's you today, I want to encourage you not to walk I want you to run. At the end of this service, we're going to have communion in just a moment, but at the end of this service, there's going to be people on either side of this sanctuary that want to pray with you. And I don't want you to walk. I want you to run as if your life depended on it. Because it does. And I want you to come, and it won't be their prayers that save you. It'll be yours. It won't be their words that will confess your sins. It'll be yours. And it won't be their words that will bring salvation. It'll be God's Son, Jesus Christ. And you then can look forward to this time more so than being afraid of it. But it will also give you and encourage you to step in for those that have not yet heard and not yet chosen. Amen?